Captain error is a common cause of a ship sinking. But when a voyage is going so badly that passengers are sleeping in their clothes because even they anticipate something bad is about to go horribly wrong, the question has to be asked whether everyone on board the doomed SS Wairarapa was equally culpable in its sinking. So how was it that such a loved passenger boat with such an accomplished crew could make such elementary mistakes in its final voyage? How is it that the deaths of 121 people could have been so easily avoided? Though built in Scotland in 1882, the SS Wairarapa would soon after go to New Zealand to become one of a small number of luxury steamers ferrying passengers across 12,000 nautical miles of the Tasman Sea to Australia. She had two engines cranking out 292 horsepower on a single screw to deliver a travel speed of 16 knots. That made her pretty quick for her size, 285.2 feet in length with a 36.3 feet beam. In fact, in her previous voyage, her graceful speed set the record for crossing in just three days and 15 hours, a bragging right that became a guiding force behind her untimely end in October 1894. When she set sail on her final voyage, she had around 170 passengers on board with 65 crew, as well as various livestock like sheep and 16 horses. In fact, some passengers would have had to share living quarters with the barn animals. But all that said and done, her cargo was lighter than average. This voyage should have been smooth sailing. But trouble started when thick fog rolled in before they had reached North Cape, the northernmost point of New Zealand's main islands. Yet the crew saw no reason to be anxious. They had even done this run in the fog before. And why shouldn't they be concerned when they are working under John McIntosh, an esteemed skipper with a mighty reputation? Little did they know that it wasn't the livestock who were the most dangerous creatures on board, but their own captain. A month before departure, McIntosh felt seriously ill. His crew feared he'd die on board, so sick was he. Yet he pulled through and seemed to be fit for duty, although some felt he wasn't his usual self. He didn't appear to be as robust as he normally was and was witnessed pacing anxiously on the bridge, smoking cigar after cigar. Could this be a side effect of the rumored opioid medication? Apparently, a friend amongst the passengers made a guess to their location, to which the captain responded, I'd be delighted if you could tell me where we are. We will never know whether he was teasing his chum or confessing guilt, but we do know that he didn't act as if anything was wrong. Instead, he ordered the boat to continue full steam ahead despite low visibility. The subsequent investigation discovered they had been navigating by dead reckoning and not compass. All this is to say that they were lost but not exhibiting caution. But if they could maintain order until they spotted the lighthouse, then it would justify the refusal to raise the alarm. The lighthouse keepers proved that the light had been lit and monitored that night, but weather conditions at this point in time had reduced its power from an impressive 18 nautical miles to two miles at best. To make matters worse, the SS Wairarapa had gone so off course that it practically eliminated all possibility for this lighthouse to set them right as the crew didn't even know where to look. By now, passengers were getting nervous. Survivors confessed to sleeping in their day clothes so that they could be ready for any sudden problem. This sentiment was shared by the crew, demonstrating that the unease had permeated all rungs of the boat's hierarchy. The second officer, who too had slept in clothes whilst off watch, returned to duty and took the emboldened stance to challenge the captain's decision to travel at this speed without any idea where they were. But Captain McIntosh was having none of this. He put this subordinate in his place. However, this dedication to speed fueled more rumors, this time about sweepstakes back home. Could it be that the captain was desperate to break his previous record for the sake of a bet that he would travel blindly? Such a move would be irresponsibly dangerous that it would have been easy for people on board to brush it off as nothing more than preposterous accusations. In fact, many crewmen had learned to keep their mouths shut around Macintosh. He was as formidable as he was experienced, and he didn't suffer fools lightly. Yet in the end, it would be him who looked ridiculous for deciding to charge ahead in the darkness of night. It was just past midnight. The watch had just changed shift when there is a cry from the deck for breakers. There was little time to react as almost immediately the boat crashed. People were thrown out of their bunks and across the bridge, but it was so dark that no one could see what they were plowing into. Despite the screaming, it was recorded that there was no widespread panic, but if anything, this stands as a testament to the group lie that had been slowly enveloping the ship. 
For example, one passenger was told that there was no cause for alarm and that the noise had just been someone slinging bricks on the foredeck. Somehow, this was believed. That was until seawater was seen sloshing about on the below decks. Soon the truth would be revealed. The ship had wrecked on steep cliffs near Miner's Head on the northern tip of the Great Barrier Island. The captain ordered the engine to go in reverse, which may have seemed logical at the time, but was in fact a bad idea. The engine overran, so the boilers had to be flooded to prevent explosions. Moving quickly, the order was given to turn on all lights, but the rising water was slowly putting the ship in pitch blackness. The only light was from the moon, but that was hindered by the thick fog. People are screaming, breakers are roaring on the cliffs. All around them was the sound of decay. Yet somehow, order was maintained enough to start launching the few lifeboats. Passengers were needed to help release the heavy wooden vessels, but as expected, their experience did not help. Now the ship was starting to list, and the remnants of order were fading fast. People were getting injured. Desperate people were prepared to jump. Panic was setting in as people came to acknowledge the truth that they had suppressed for so long. Ten minutes after the crash, the boat came to settle in the ground, only to be hit and turn turtle with the mast facing downwards. The women and children in their ships, unfortunately, slipped to the port rail and were washed overboard when the boat canted. Discipline completely broke down immediately when crew and passengers both rushed boats. Whoever hadn't been able to scramble for their life rafts was open to the gigantic waves that were picking people off the upturned hull. In the water, you had to contend with rough seas dashing you against the rocks as well as panicked people and horses in the water. Some deaths were caused by the blunt trauma of a horse hoof, while others pulled under by those who couldn't swim. The ship was breaking up now, and those who hadn't drowned were stuck on the reef to fend off the rising tide, or held on tightly to the rigging, with their numbers depleting with each large wave. Miraculously, a sense of order returned. The few lifeboats that had launched stayed by the shipwreck to pick up screaming survivors amongst the bopping corpses. There were many individual stories of heroism, like a man carrying a boy on his back through the waters, and a woman hauled up by a rope, laid by chance by a forward-thinking sailor. Two hours later or so, the boat started to break up and the last few people on board had to act quickly. Captain McIntosh jumped over the side into the sea but was never seen again, as were the forty or so others on the bridge who were unable to escape. By now, daybreak was coming and survivors were about to witness the ordeal they had just been through. One boat would eventually succeed in reaching a local community of Nadi Wai Muri, who was able to rescue some survivors. Meanwhile, those on the reefs used ropes and pulleys to bring people to higher ground. Three days later, a steamer would come by to secure the rest of the survivors, of which only two were children. 135 souls were lost that day. The subsequent court inquiry ruled Captain McIntosh's actions were the primary cause of the tragedy, but it's pure speculation whether his eagerness to get home early was motivated by how sickness, opium, or his ego. However, many people knew something was wrong but refused to supersede their skipper, demonstrating the depth of their complicity. Then again, the fact everyone worked together in the pitch black is also a testament to their individual bravery. But who do you think is at fault? Let us know in the comments. If you'd like to have more stories of nightmare disasters, leave a like to let us know. Don't forget to share this with a fan of New Zealand naval history, and hit subscribe to stay up to date with all our videos. Thanks for watching.